Blessings to all, and welcome to another episode of Elevate the Mic, and I'm your host, Max Mupese. Today is a very special day, because I have a legend sitting next to me, somebody I like to call a veteran, somebody who's paved the way for so many individuals in the city of Montreal. He just recently celebrated 20 years of working at CBC Radio, over 33 years of experience, a brother from the Nation of Islam, a brother who stands on business, and somebody who's the real deal. Let's, uh, let us all welcome Duke Eatman. How you doing, man? How you doing, Max? Before anything, I yes. want to thank you for inviting me. You know, this is a beautiful setup that you have here. Mm -hmm. I've enjoyed your show. Thank you. You got a great team. and We can see why your show looks as good as it does. And you've had great guests on, my man Dice B, mm -hmm. Ricky D, Steve Padgett. But you do an incredible job. Thank you. And you are part of the reason that we did the things that we did. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what? Let me not speak for other people. Let me speak for myself. Mm -hmm. You are part of the reason why I pound the pavement for 33 years to open those doors to make this happen. And you do an incredible job at it. So I thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Thank you. So what I like is that we have something in common, many things in common, but you grew up in NDG, right? Yes. Yes. Got it. Could you tell us about your upbringing and where, well, basically, if I'm not mistaken, you have... Um, a mother who's from my mother my mother my father's black and my mother's native american excellent perfect could you tell us a little bit more about your upbringing and how how uh growing up in ng how grew up in ndg uh shaped your your perspective for the most part you know when i was first born it was actually in the east end mm -hmm. i was born in the east end and moved to ndg when i was about like nine years old mm -hmm. but even before moving to ndg my parents met in a record store downtown my mother was a uh manager at a record store. She's still in the teens. Mm -hmm. My father used to go in every day and that's how they met. So I was kind of born into this. Mm -hmm. Plus there's musicians and loads of musicians on both sides of my family. And it really, really was a real musical upbringing. Mm -hmm. And you got to remember now, my, my mom was in her late teens and my father was in his 20s. So they're still young people, right? Mm -hmm. So they did what young people do. They have parties, they play music, they go to concerts. Mm -hmm. The only difference is they bring me with them. Mm. So when I was like three, you know, my mother spent all night camping outside the Montreal Forum mm. to buy tickets for James Brown. Mm. So, you know, one of my earliest concerts was five rows back, center stage, James Brown at the Montreal Forum, mm. which is not a concert. It's like a religious experience. <laughs> people, people dancing on the seats, <laughs> getting arrested in the aisles. That's different. It, you know, that, that's a whole thing. So, I mean, that whole atmosphere was there and it really was an exciting period it was an exciting period for music it was an exciting period to be black because we're coming out of the turbulent 60s mm. and so Montreal's black community was still very close close-knit yes I remember as a child walking down St. Lawrence Street with my father and my grandfather and one of my great uncles and thinking that all black people in the city knew each other mm. It's not that they knew each other, it's that everybody just kind of nodded at everybody. Mm. What's up? Yes. What's happening? Right? Yes, yes. Slapped each other five. You understand what I'm saying? Mm. They said, wow, my dad and my grandpa know everybody. But it's because it was a very close-knit community mm. during that time. Mm -hmm. It was about survival, right? right. Like we're, we're black and we're still here. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's greet each other, right? Um, it was an exciting time. There was exciting things happening in music. I grew up. Um, listening to the music of Curtis Mayfield, mm -hmm. James Brown, Sly and the Family Stone, Aretha Franklin, mm -hmm. right? Nina Simone, Billy Preston. And by the time we moved to NDG, things were changing in the music industry. You saw the advent of disco, which still produced some great music. You mm -hmm. know, artists like Sylvester right. and the Tramps, these were pioneering artists, you know. Whenever black people did a particular style of music, mm -hmm. they always stretched the boundaries of it because, I mean, it all descends from black music anyway, you yes, know? Sir. By the time I moved to NDG, um, things were changing again. And I remember it was the latter part of 1979, mm -hmm. and we were driving in a car, and we had on a French radio station. Mm -hmm. Not that we had it on, but my father would like channel surf until we heard something good, and we heard something come on, and these guys were talking. They were talking over a beat instead of singing, kind of like James Brown was doing. Mm -hmm. But James Brown would do it for like a couple of bars, mm -hmm. right? This was the whole song. And it was long. The song was like 15 minutes. And we just listened to it, and me and my parents just grooving. Mm -hmm. I just turned 10. Mm -hmm. That song was Rapper's Delight by the Sugar Hill Gang. Hey. And so 
right when I moved to MBG during that time period, it's a new neighborhood, it's a new upbringing, and also it's a new musical revolution happening. Mm. And it had happened all at once. And it was the advent of ghetto blasters. You know, in the 70s, people had tape recorders, but mm. you know, a little tape recorder just to hear your music. Mm. Now you had a, a tape deck for a party, right? Hey. Like you played on the street, it was like a party, you know? Mm. And it really was an exciting time period. Uh, all my friends that I grew up with in NDG, you know, your, your Winstons and Larrys and Carla and Victor and Jason and all the guys we grew up with, we were part of that. Um, we never saw it as something revolutionary at the time. We mm -hmm. thought it was going to die any minute now. Okay. We were just enjoying it for the mm -hmm. moment. This was exciting, right? Breaking mm -hmm. and, and rapping and DJing and all that. But it turned out to be the longest lasting style of popular music because it's still around. Mm. If you take rock and roll, for instance, let's, let's, let's call rock and roll's advent 1955. Yes. Right? So by 1980, you know, we saw, let's say, not the end of rock and roll, but we saw a changing of the guard, right? Mm -hmm. Punk rock, disco, hip hop. Yes. So from 1955 to 1980, Right, so 55 to 75 mm -hmm. is 20 years. Mm -hmm. Add another five, that's 25. Mm -hmm. Hip hop just celebrated its 50th anniversary, but from its commercial right. advent, it's like 40. That's it. So hip hop has outlasted jazz, rock and roll, punk, Seriously. grunge, whatever you think about. So for something that we thought would really end in a year or two, mm -hmm. it's still here and still going strong. Mm. I like that you're sharing the the actual history of it and what you learned from that experience could you tell us what were some of the things that stood out specifically in the anglophone community contrary to the francophone community as you were growing up uh, and learning about hip-hop well at that time if you want me to be honest yes. the francophone community had no part in hip-hop when mm -hmm. i say no part i mean they weren't into that mm -hmm. first of all because it was it was english not that francophones weren't listening to english music they certainly weren't listening to hip hop. Mm -hmm. That would have started, let's say, around 87, 88. So the first eight years in this city, hip hop was music for an Anglophone mm -hmm. community, mm -hmm. especially one in the West. Yes. Because that's where most Anglophones were situated in EG, LaSalle, Burgundy, mm -hmm. Cote de Neige, you know, all those areas. And if I'm missing any out, I, I don't mean any disrespect. Mm -hmm. um, but for young black teenagers growing up in that part of the city, it was like our punk rock, mm. meaning our rebellious music, right? Mm. How did we rebel? Well, music at that time was made up of bands. Mm. And I was still into the bands, and I'm a musician myself, who, and I play a few mm. instruments. Mm. But this was like punk rock. The way punk rock turned its thumbs up at rock and roll, right. hip-hop was turning its thumbs up at R&B and disco and all that other stuff. So there's no band, it's just a DJ. Mm -hmm. You know, or like the Beastie Boys said, two turntables and a microphone, right? Mm -hmm. And it was something about it that was very street, very rebellious, very unique, very different. Mm -hmm. And of course, in the end, we liked everything. And we still listened to our R&B and our rock and our pop and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But we had something unique, something special. And from my point of view, it was also something that I studied. Mm -hmm. A lot of black teenagers, including myself, but not everybody did. I was one of them. We were into magazines. Mm -hmm. We were into sports magazines and music magazines. And if you were a black teenager, you bought Right On. Mm -hmm. You bought Black Beat, mm -hmm. um, Rock and Soul, Blues and Soul. Mm -hmm. And so you could read about all this stuff. So I took it upon myself to learn early on who are the Cold Crush Brothers, who's Grandmaster Flash, mm -hmm. who's DJ Cool Herc, African Bada, yes. right, and understand the story. I don't know that it's part and parcel to know the history and to know the story, right? Mm -hmm. Like, for instance, you could be a great boxer and not necessarily have studied boxers of the past. Right. You could be a great basketball player and not have studied basketball players of the past. Mm -hmm. But the ones that do have that extra arsenal yes. in their game, right? So there are great hip-hop artists who do great music till this day who might not necessarily know who DJ Kool Herc is mm -hmm. or, you know, who... Busy B was or Fab Five Freddy. Mm. But those that do have that as a foundation and they can add that as extra layers on what it is that they do. Mm. And I was always somebody like that. Mm. I was also an only child for the first 10 and a half years. Okay. 
my younger brother's almost 11 years younger than me. Mm -hmm. So it meant that I was mainly around adults as a child, which okay. means that I took in all this stuff. I knew about Watergate because everybody in the house was talking about it. Mm. Right? My father said, the president's going to jail. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I mean, he didn't go to jail, but... And so, being around adults, I took in a lot of adult information mm -hmm. and an adult's approach to doing things. Mm -hmm. And so with music, because I just didn't want to do music, I wanted to know everything about it. Mm -hmm. I wanted to understand it. And I don't have anything negative to say about anybody that didn't take it upon themselves right. to study that history. What I can say is they missed out on quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Because once you know that, what you're seeing and witnessing now, mm -hmm. it makes more sense. Mm -hmm. You know, like it kind of ties everything together. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I encourage anybody, I mean, if you want, but whatever it is that you're doing, study the history behind it. Mm -hmm. Because I think you might still be doing good things now, mm -hmm. but you're going to do better things then. Right. You With understand? that arsenal, yes. Right. Yes. And it's, it's important. It's important mm -hmm. um, because you're missing out on so much. That's it. I like that you talked about uh, having an arsenal, building a foundation. One thing's for sure is that when we have discussions also, we had a, a few discussions in the past, and one thing that, that stood out out of, out of one of the discussions we've had is like, you said something very interesting, how a lot of people who contributed to the culture of hip hop like to personalize it, like, oh, I was there, I right. was the person behind it. But before even thinking about personalize it, you have to remember what was the cause and the cause right. was something to uplift the consciousness of the people and you know create that rebellious spirit so do you think at this very moment at this very moment when you look at today's hip-hop do you think that's something that's missing or it's it's still it's still alive but hidden in the certain places i've heard for years especially after the golden era of hip-hop 87 to 92 that hip-hop is dead Mm. And then I heard it at the end of the gangster rap period, hip hop is dead. Then they kept saying it after yeah. the bling period. But the truth of the matter is, it's like anything. There's always pockets of great stuff. Mm. And I don't call things bad. Mm. Or I like to just say maybe not as great stuff. Mm -hmm. There's great hip hop artists today. Mm. Um, and there always has been, just like there is in everything. It's just it may not necessarily be what you hear on the radio. Mm, that's right? it. It that's may true. not be the most streamed song on Spotify, mm -hmm. but there's always good stuff. You just have to look for it. Mm -hmm. The only thing that I would say different about the hip hop era of the past, so before the golden era, which is 87 to 92, mm -hmm. Public Enemy, Boogie Down Productions, De La Soul, Shop Call Quest, Jungle Brothers, Egg Me, Rakim, Ice-T, Ice Cube, mm -hmm. UMCs, Queen Latifah, Moni mm -hmm. Love, there's the first period the period I grew up in. Yes. And what was incredibly unique, the top groups at the time, you had Curtis Blow, mm -hmm. Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, mm -hmm. Run DMC, Houdini, Fat Boys, mm -hmm. Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, and not a single one of them, even remotely, sounded like the other. Mm -hmm. You couldn't. Cool Mo D. Cool Mo D and Treacherous Tree didn't sound like anyone else. That's a good point. You weren't allowed. You get mm -hmm. your hip hop card revoked. They call you a sucker MC <laughs> or a biter. Yeah. I challenge anybody. Go back and listen to that music and try to find similarities. There's none. Mm -hmm. There's none. You, it was incumbent that you be original and that you have your own lane. Mm. And they all did. I think a lot of people today sound alike. Yes. But then you always have those that stand out. Mm -hmm. Ain't nobody sound like Kendrick Lamar. No. Ain't nobody sound like J. Cole. No. You know, these, these are artists. Uh, Rhapsody. Rhapsody, too. I mean, Rhapsody's on a whole other thing. And she pays homage, you know, in the video for Empty Hodge, man, she's paying homage to Roxanne Chante. And so there's always good things happening. I don't like to look at it in terms of it wasn't as good as our era. Right. That's old man talk. <laughs> I'm going to be honest. Right. Like Too many people from my generation talk like that. Mm. 
That's all man talk. I don't want to be with the, that bitterness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want to be with the old folks. Right. I want to be with the young folks because <laughs> it's their turn now. Yes. Right. Dick Clark used to host American Bandstand, right? Mm -hmm. He did that for decades. So when he had artists in the 70s on, he didn't talk about how it was in the 60s and 50s. Mm -hmm. He was welcoming them. Mm -hmm. And then in the 80s when he had like, you know, uh, Wham! on and mm -hmm. Duran Duran and Corey Hart and uh, Five Star, whoever, he was caught in that time. Mm -hmm. So w we older folk, we need to be right with our young people in mm -hmm. their time doing their thing. We had our, our time, mm. and our time is not over, but the spotlight goes to younger people. Mm. And let's focus on that because a lot of them are doing some great, incredible things. Mm. Um, you don't want to be that old guy complaining about how things used to be back in the day. You know, things were great, and young people are going to continue to do great things. Yes. Absolutely. Speaking of which, what's your best answer to how could we bridge the gap? between the younger generation, today's generation, and those who experienced the revolution of hip hop or like the, the actual beginning phase of hip hop, what would you say is the best way to bridge the gap? Think about how you felt when you were young, mm. right there. When we were young, we didn't like people, and in this particular case, older people approaching us in a certain way. Yes. We didn't want to hear our music being called noise. Mm. We didn't want to be told that we were crazy and you know, there was no redeeming factors in what it is that we were doing. My father was a brilliant man. Mm. I lost my father a year and a half ago. A year and a half ago. May you yeah. rest in power, Pops. And I remember during my teenage years, we went through what a lot of people go through, that very difficult period where you clash heads, mm. right? You're a young man. You think you're a man now, right? <laughs> you got all the answers. Right, 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 right. Yeah. I ain't no shit. But, you know, you think you do. And you <laughs> you want to... So we had a very tumultuous relationship mm. for for uh, for a moment and then uh, I was working I was 18 and I was working at a restaurant and uh, I wasn't living at home anymore I had my own place my own apartment surrounded by all my recording equipment and instruments and I was making my music and mm -hmm. he, he called me at work and he said uh, if you want to come over later mm -hmm. and we hadn't been talking for a bit we were going through one of our things. Well, not one of our things. I was going through one of my things, acting like a brat, right? <laughs> he said, Much Music is doing a one-hour special on Prince. Mm. So they're going to show all his videos. You want to come over to watch it? See, it was my father's way of reaching out to me to spend time with his son, but he used what he Wait, knew I liked. Exactly, I was going to say that. And not only used that, but as we would watch it, he would compare him to people of his time and put, put Prince on their level. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like, man, the people from my time oh, were wow. much better. He would say, you know what, man? Mm -hmm. Prince could have hung with Sly. Mm -hmm. Prince does James Brown as good as James Brown, right? Even though I'm a bit of a freak show because right. those guys were my era as well, right? Because <laughs> right. I was when I was two or three. But he was finding the great qualities in him. Yes. So he was able to bridge that gap mm -hmm. by pointing out the, the positive. That's brilliant. Right. That's brilliant. And so, and, and until Prince passed away, my father never stopped praising him, or whatever mm. the case may be, you know? So, just think about how you were, when you were young, how you wanted to be approached, and we need to approach those young people like that, and they will come to us, mm. right? Because when you're young, you do feel it's your time. You're in that zone, because mm. you are. You're taking over the world. Mm. And we gotta let them take it over. And we can share that experience, mm -hmm. but not be condescending. Mm. Say, you know, yes, Eric B and Rakim were great. Public Enemy were great. But y'all got some great stuff, too. Mm. So let's see what those two things have in common. Got it. Yes, you know what I mean? Yes. Let's, let's, let's maybe look at J. Cole or Kendrick Lamar and say, well, you know, they're kind of like the KRS of their generation. Mm. You understand what I mean? 100%. And then I think, because young people always want guidance. Even mm. when I was young, I wanted guidance. Even when I didn't know it, mm. I knew I needed guidance. But we, we have to stop tripping. That's it. We have to stop tripping and, 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 and you know, um, get off ourselves. Mm. You know what I mean? I, I want to go back to what you said, uh, having things in common. You're also a brother from the Nation of Islam. Could you tell us a few things that you were able to see that hip-hop today, today's hip-hop, has in common with, you know, the foundation of Nation of Islam, certain things that, even if it's not necessarily certain things that are in common, but some things that you'd wish to see in hip-hop that you see in the Nation of Islam. 
The teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad have permeated every aspect of hip hop culture. Mm. And it seemed for a while that it hadn't, but it did, right? So when hip hop first came out, it, be it became the musical revolution that began in New York City, right? In the Bronx, in Brooklyn, money making Manhattan, in Harlem, uptown. And even the early braggadocio aspect of hip hop still has its foundation and teachings in the Nation of Islam, mm -hmm. and in some cases even more closely related into an offshoot, which is the Nation of Gods and Earths. Yes. That teach you the black man is God, mm -hmm. and you're a king, you're a queen, mm -hmm. right? The black man is God, the black woman is the earth, mm -hmm. the mother earth. Mm -hmm. From all, you know, everybody comes from her. Mm -hmm. And so even some of that braggadocio stuff was directly influenced whether you realize it or not. Mm -hmm. But then it came full circle with the golden era. So you have public enemy. The S1Ws, mm -hmm. the majority of them are all members of the Nation of Islam. Mm -hmm. They're all registered FOI. Brother mm -hmm. James Baum and Brother Norman and all these cats. Mm -hmm. um, and the teachings were directly influenced by what was going on with the teachings of the Nation of Islam. Yes. And, but the difference with that era is people like Karis one and Chuck D, they started dropping the names. Right. And they would, you know, quote the different ministers, right? And so it came around again. And then all of a sudden the gold wasn't in style. You wore black medallions, mm -hmm. right? And you were very Afrocentric in your lyrics. You were about black power, upliftment, mm -hmm. self-determination. Mm -hmm. And the teachings were were, were very, very, very um, present. Mm -hmm. Even people that weren't Muslim, so to speak, mm -hmm. were dropping those bombs. Yes. I mean, how many people would sample Minister Farrakhan or Dr. Khaled in their music, mm. whether, whether or not they were Muslims or not, right? Mm. And those teachings were very much part of a positive aspect of how hip hop could go beyond being a great musical revolution, but how it could uplift people, right? Mm. Popular culture plays a big role in helping to change society. Mm -hmm. You had a different world, which was an offshoot of the Cosby show. Mm -hmm. If I'm not mistaken, the biggest enrollment in modern times in historical black colleges and universities came after a different world came on the air. Right. Because young black high school students could see, wow, it's really cool to be in college, at a mm -hmm. black college, and it's really cool to go to university. And, you watching Dwayne Wayne and you watching all the characters and you know Spike Lee revolutionized film because at that time black life depicted on the film was not it wasn't done by black people right. even a lot of the black exploitation films if there was black directors mm -hmm. um, they weren't necessarily always black producers mm -hmm. so they told the story from that point of view mm -hmm. Spike Lee was one of the first black filmmakers to tell our stories from a black person's point of view. Mm -hmm. So it revolutionized film. This is all happening at the yes. same time, right? This is like mid 80s to late 80s. Mm -hmm. And then of course, the golden era, hip hop goes very political. Mm -hmm. Now I don't wanna say that the politics and hip hop began in the golden era, mm -hmm. because one of the most political songs ever is The Message by Grandmaster Flash yes. and Curious Five, 1982. Run DMC were very political. It's like that, hard times. Mm -hmm. Under 1986 album, Proud to be black mm. from Raising Hell. So it was already starting. But then Chuck D and Public Enemy just took off. Took it to a whole other level, right? And then, you know, years later, you know, I would become partners with Chuck D and we would do yes. so many projects together. I mean, that was a dream come true. Mm -hmm. But it was an exciting time period. But it also marked the end of that era. Mm. Because it becomes a lot harder to control an artist and to not necessarily give him what's his mm. when he has knowledge of self, yes. when he has a community, mm -hmm. Muslims, when he um, is educated in those aspects of the business, that it's a music business, mm -hmm. it's not just music. If you want to do music, you can stay in your bedroom and do music all day long if you want. If you want to get into this thing, you got to become a businessman because mm -hmm. it's the music business, right? And so, They've often talked about, um, was there a conspiracy mm -hmm. to destroy the socially conscious hip hop of that era? Yes. I couldn't tell you how it was done because I would be speculating, mm -hmm. but I do believe that it occurred.
Mm. I do believe that they did everything they could to stop the Chuck D's, yeah. the KRS's, mm -hmm. and um, the way the industry works, it can decide in many ways what it wants to be popular. Mm. And it sort of marked the end of that era. It never went away. But I would say the teachings of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad influenced the greatest period of hip hop of 87 Absolutely. to 92. Absolutely. Yeah, I could agree with that. Now, you, you mentioned Chuck D. Could you tell us about um, your, early, your early times of even uh, meeting Chuck D? Because there's an interesting story you, you shared with me. I'd like to hear about it again. My, I've always wanted to work with Chuck, and I always felt that I would one day. I just didn't know how. Right. And at the time, I was, um, I was doing a, a radio show at, uh, well, I, was, I was working in two places. I was working at CJD, and I was hosting a radio show there. I was hosting three shows at CJD. Um, no, hosting one mm -hmm. on Saturday nights called Saturday Night in Montreal with Duke Eatman that was on every Saturday night from 7 to 11, mm -hmm. and I would play a potpourri of all sorts of music. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's CJD, right? So you got to have a little bit of everything because it's not a music station. Mm -hmm. And I was co-hosting three, two other shows. And I was still at the first station I ever began at in 91, CHAI 101.9 FM in Chattagay. Mm -hmm. I did a show there called A Soul Experience. And um, the Smoke and Grooves tour had just come to Montreal. Mm -hmm. And the one thing that had bothered me about, to me, who is still the greatest hip hop group of all time, most revolutionary, not just in terms of subject matter, but music, Public Enemy with the Bomb Squad changed the way hip hop was produced. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was just layers upon layers upon layers of samples and noise that sounded beautifully insane. Mm -hmm. What I didn't like about the live show is that they would actually perform their vocals over vocal tracks. Okay. And I always found that weird. Chuck D will be the first to tell you that the reason that he did that till this very day is that he's got a hard time remembering lyrics. <laughs> and he has a lot of songs. Right. So, I mean, if you kind of forgot a few lyrics here and there, well, the record's playing, you can't really tell. That's it. But I didn't like that. It didn't feel like it was live. It, you're just playing the record. Chuck on his website, publicenemy.com, made it very clear how you could, you know, um, communicate with him and correspond. Mm -hmm. So my partner at the time, DJ Distinct, we, we wrote him a letter mm -hmm. saying, man, you know, we love y'all. And we, we've done endless Public Enemy specials, we'll continue to. Mm -hmm. But we've got a problem with the live show with this thing over the vocals. It sounds weird. It sounds like it's like two different people. Like we're hearing you and we're hearing the vocals. Like, What's going on? Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like. He wrote us a letter back with Malcolm X stamps, okay. which was pretty ironic because, you know, in the song Fight the Power, he says most of my heroes don't appear on those stamps, right? <laughs> which still stands true till this day because most of his heroes still don't. Mm. Just one did. Mm -hmm. And he explained the reason behind it, mm -hmm. which to me, till this very day, I always thought was a weak explanation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but something very special came out of that. They stopped doing it. Mm. Okay, like, after explaining yeah. why we do it, yeah, they, they took they notes. Stop <laughs> doing it. Hey. And he said, but let's continue to correspond. Mm. So it was the beginning of a friendship. Mm -hmm. We're like, wow. Like, we expected that if he actually corresponded at all, it wouldn't be a positive one, but it was a very positive one. Mm -hmm. And then they brought the Poison tour from their first album after leaving Dev Jam. There was a Poison going on mm -hmm. to Montreal at the old Rainbow Concert Hall, where it used to be Rainbow Whites. And then we finally got to meet face to face mm -hmm. and um, he said by the way in the tour bus he said I got a stack of cassettes like this that's all the specials you've done on Public Enemy he says I refer to them okay sometimes when he can't remember things about he you know he refers to them right like oh yeah yeah we did that you know and I was just honored that he actually had the cassettes with him and we began a relationship where then we started doing a radio show together uh, in New York City on WBAI mm -hmm. which was part of the Pacifica Network which is kind of like a revolutionary radio network with stations in Miami, Milwaukee, New York. Mm -hmm. The great thing about the one in New York is that it's a type of place where guys like Bob Dylan would just drop in unannounced or Harry Belafonte mm -hmm. and just sit down with whoever was hosting and talk or maybe even play and sing. Mm -hmm. It was kind of a counterculture station and then it developed into a network. Mm -hmm. So we started doing a show called You Don't Stop. We would record our parts here. Mm -hmm. And we did a segment on there called This Day in Hip Hop History. So it was for every day of the week. So we do it for a week long. So 
December 4th, December 5th. Mm -hmm. And we'd play the music and then talk about what happened on that day. Okay. So, you know, on this day, LL Cool J releases his debut album, you know, radio, right. on Def Jam Records. The history behind it. Right, and give you the whole thing. James Todd Smith, right? Mm -hmm. And then we started working really closely together. And Chuck said, you know what, man? Why don't we make that into a book? And I okay. said, wow. So anyway, we spent five years making that book and still doing a radio show at the same time. And the book that came out was called This Day in Hip Hop and Rap History. Mm -hmm. And for close to a year, it was a bestseller at Amazon for music history books. Congratulations. Thank you. Amazing. People can still get the book, right? Absolutely. You, and you can, uh, you can get it at uh, any of the stores, whether it's in the go or what, whatnot. And then there's also an audio version available that Chuck Voice as well. That's amazing. Yeah, that was a quite an experience. It almost made me not ever want to do a book again. <laughs> Why because, is that? because it's long. Mm, like it's five years. Process, right, yeah. And then there's the editing period. And then uh, about a year and a half ago, Chuck D came up with a couple of, called me one night. He had a couple of other ideas for some new books. I'm like, oh, here we go again. I don't want to go down that path. <laughs> but one of them was very exciting because he sort of reminded me of a book that I wanted to do. Mm. And it was the making of Fear of a Black Planet. Mm. because it really is an interesting story and it would be based on our conversations from the last 20 years mm. talking about it a lot of people would be really shocked to find out how that groundbreaking album was made mm -hmm. and the story behind it and he said well you know we don't we don't control the publishing mm. for that record anymore that's universal so you can tell everybody what we sampled because <laughs> they can't sue us anymore right. <laughs> um, so yeah I'm working on that again you know, I, I make jokes because it really was a long, painful process, but I'm mm. looking forward to doing that. It's good. Speaking of process, uh, I was able to read a little bit about your story. What intrigued me was that uh, at one point you were a single father. Yes. And you had two, th two to three different jobs. You had two yeah. radio jobs, working in the daytime and evening, if I'm not mistaken. Doing security for artists as well. Yeah. Okay. Could you tell us about, because um, we're talking about mi music business, right? Could right. you tell us? The resilience it takes for anybody who's watching this right now as a single parent, specifically a single father, like it could be a single mother, and what it really took for you to get to the position you're in today? Well, you know, I'm going to paint a scenario for you. It might disturb some people. So I'm hosting Street Sounds at K103, the most popular evening music show, playing the best in hip-hop, R&B, reggae, soca, mm -hmm. from 6 to midnight every night. And people would hear my voice, and they I love your voice. I said, you got a nice, deep voice. I used to get a lot of female callers saying, oh, I love that voice. <laughs> but if only they could hear while I was back selling a song, I had my two-year-old daughter, butt naked, on a table, wiping her butt, changing her diapers, mm. while I was back selling that song. Right, you know, exactly. And in, in personally enjoying every moment of it. Mm. But you're hearing a voice on the radio, you have no idea. Yeah, yeah. I'm wiping this two-year-old's butt. Mm, you yeah. know, in this business, the majority of people are not going to ever make money. The way that you're going to graduate to where you can be able to earn your living doing this mm -hmm. is willing to hustle during the whole time. Mm. People think that this business, you go somewhere and you knock at the door and there's, hey, come on in. We got tons of money for you. That's not it. There are superstars <laughs> till this very day that are probably doing a lot less better than most of the people in this room. Mm. It is something that you have got to be willing to do what it is that you have to do. Mm. And if, you, if you're able to persevere and you're able to hang in there and, and fake it till you make it, mm. you will get there. Mm. You absolutely will make it. It's just that not everybody is willing to sacrifice that mm. and wait. So it meant that, yeah, I was working four or five days on the radio, six hours a night. Yeah. But on the weekends when they would call me to do security for Talib Kweli or Marilyn Manson, mm. you go. When they would call me because they needed a substitute phys ed teacher at a private school, right. elementary school, you mm. go. You do whatever it is that you have to do. Mm -hmm because it's a very tough business to be able to work at it full time, making your living doing that in the beginning. Mm. But then slowly it gets easier. Mm. 
because you make your mark. And I want to tell everybody out there that if you're really determined enough, mm -hmm. I really do believe you will make it. Mm. Like, you really, really will. I remember listening to the radio in the 90s, and it was Steven Spielberg. He was doing an interview. Mm -hmm. um, it was on CINQ. Right. I think that was the name. No, not CINQ. CIQC, which was the old uh, CFCF station. Mm -hmm. It was the AM station. And they were interviewing. They weren't interviewing it, but they would actually... Um, they would just buy these interviews. Mm -hmm. You know, they would syndicate it. And right. somebody was interviewing uh, Steven Spielberg. Yes. And you had all these aspiring filmmakers calling in. I'm not making no money. Damn. I'm not getting anything. And, and he said something. He says, that's how it is in the beginning. Mm -hmm. But he says, if you really, really believe in this thing, you really believe in it, mm -hmm. you're really passionate about making films and you're willing to hang in there no matter how long you are eventually going to find a way to make your living making films mm. and that could range from making a comfortable living to pay your bills and yes. do what you got to do or you could be the next Spike Lee or Martin Scorsese mm. but if you really want to do it you will achieve it mm. but you're going to be tested that's it every religion every spiritual belief has some sort of error or tenet where you are being tested. Mm -hmm. You're going through a very, very tough period, mm -hmm. right? Sometimes it's not a gold shirt and an ascot. Sometimes it's <laughs> sweatsuit period. Yes. <laughs> and running shoes. <laughs> but if you hang in there, mm -hmm. you will make it. You're going to be tested. How badly do you want this? Mm -hmm. And... I don't think there's too many stories of people that have been successful in any industry right. that didn't have to put in a certain amount of hard work. Mm. And so I don't think it's a matter of when, it's a matter of are you going to hang in there? And if you will, you are going to make it. Mm. You are a prime example of making it. You do an incredible job at what it is that you're doing. Thank this didn't you. happen overnight for you. No. You put in years of hustle. And, you know, this, this team that you got here, you know, the people in this room, the people out behind the glass, these are all people that work very hard at what it is that they're doing. Mm -hmm. And they're going to continue to mm -hmm. because they want to make it. Mm -hmm. It's just that I ran into so many people where they didn't become a star overnight and they're like, oh, <laughs> I thought I was supposed No, it doesn't work like that. Mm -hmm. That's like anything. You want to go to the gym, you want to get in shape, mm -hmm. depending on how much work you put in, you will get into shape. It. It's not going to happen overnight. No. You're not going to go there and spend three hours and, and come out looking like Schwarzenegger, right? <laughs> but eventually, you know, you run, you do the treadmill, you start doing the rowing machine, you start mm. doing the weights, you start to thin out. Some of the weight starts to fall off. Mm. The muscle mass starts to develop a bit. The body mm. starts to tighten up. And you get to a point where you almost want to quit. But then you look in the mirror one day and say, wow, mm -hmm. I'm actually starting to like what I see. Because there is results if you don't quit. Mm -hmm. I myself have lost almost 117 pounds in the last two and a half years. Congratulations, man. Congratulations. Thank I'd you. love to hear that. Now, Just don't quit. Yes. This episode is brought to you by Urban Eats Montreal. It is a YouTube channel that does restaurant reviews. So make sure you follow Urban Eats Montreal and you'll learn a lot more about them. Thank you, Urban Eats. So yes, I want to ask you this. When you look at, when you look at the trajectory of your career, what you've done and what you've accomplished, what is one thing you would tell a 14-year-old Duke Eatman today? You know, I was very hard-headed as a kid. And I'm very hard-headed as an adult. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes hard-headed in areas that you shouldn't be. But the one area that I was happy that I never bent was in my creative endeavors. Mm. I never lost my vision. I never sold out. I wanted to do things a certain way. And the one thing that I would tell a 14-year-old Duke is, in other areas of your life, listen to people. Take their advice. Mm -hmm. But in your artistic vision, do not compromise. Mm. Continue doing it. You're going to win in the end. That's powerful. That's powerful. 
Last few questions. Uh, what is a book that you're currently reading or if not a book that you read recently that completely blew you away? Like The book that I never put down is Message to the Black Man in America by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Um, it's the mantra that I live by. Um, the autobiography of Malcolm X was always very uplifting. Mm -hmm. I really, really was a big fan of Mike Tyson's autobiography. It mm -hmm. came out about 10 years ago. Right. And I think what impressed me about it was we have this vision of this man, mm -hmm. this ferocious, very dangerous, self-destructive man yes. who transformed this image that he himself created but explains in his book that it was created out of insecurity, mm. of not having come from much, being full of fear and creating this persona to hide that fear. Mm. Mike Tyson says in his book, I was petrified of every man that I ever stepped in a ring against. Jeez. It would always be a pattern. As we get closer to the fight, I have dreams that he knocks me out, mm. right? And he says, it comes from me being insecure as a child, grew up in Brooklyn. Yes. When he used to call him Dirty Mike mm. because he never showered, didn't have much clothes, didn't have much of anything going for him. Right. He was able to strip himself naked of the world and share his insecurities with everybody and say, oh, wait, I can relate to that. I had that insecurity. Mm. Oh, I can relate to that. I had that. And he transformed himself. Mike Tyson today is people that people give their babies to. And take a picture. It's true, yeah. You would have gave Mike Tyson your baby <laughs> in 1988 to take a picture with. Far away from that you man. You understand <laughs> what I'm saying? He transformed who he was. And I think what impressed me the most about it is that he had arrived at a point in his career where, you know, he wasn't boxing anymore and he proved who he was as an athlete. Still the youngest heavyweight champion ever to win the title at age 20. But he said, that that guy, he said, that's 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 not me. That's somebody I invented so that you wouldn't see the real me. Mm. And I said, it takes more strength to make yourself vulnerable mm. and tell everybody about your fears and insecurities rather than to keep up this facade. Mm. And I think when that book came out and Mike Tyson was able to divulge all this, I think that's what made him the baddest nice. man on the planet. Mm. Very impressive in the ring, but much more impressive out of the ring. So I find that book inspirational as a as person, well. the character. Absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. So could you, could you end off this interview with a, a last few words, something that you'd like the people to know and to keep in mind if ever they tell themselves, oh, I remember Duke Eatman, but I want to remember him for the last few words he said. I never wavered from what it is that I wanted to do. And I didn't always know what was at the end of the road, but I knew something fulfilling was coming and something was good, and I never stopped. And there were very low periods, then there were high periods, and then they got low again, and then they got high again and they haven't stopped. Mm. Because I never sold myself out, I never sold my people out. My parents were a very important part of my life. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes we go through very tough periods with our parents, right? Because we're trying to find our way, our way and yes. we're trying to develop ourselves. But they had so much to share with me. And then with my children, I went through a period where I was trying to dictate to them and tell them how it was, and that didn't work out. Mm -hmm. And then I was able to say, no, you know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. You follow your dream, and I'll support you no matter what it is. They're doing very well today. They're in their 20s today. Um, the most important thing, however, mm -hmm. is that if you have a vision of something you want to do and you believe in it like for real mm -hmm. don't ever give it up don't give yourself a time period because as long as you're still breathing it's your time mm. just that hey man it was a pleasure to have you here it's it's always an honor to have a discussion with you to know what you have going on and certain things that that are inspiring you and certain things that you're able to to leave behind for the next generation and all I got to say is just the story is amazing and people are definitely going to join this interview, I'm pretty sure. I'm well, confident. I'll, I'll tell you something. If whatever little it is that I did <laughs> produce this, meaning yourself, brother, and your team, then it was worth it. Thank you, man. Appreciate it, dude. Thank you, brother. All right.
Another episode of Elevate the Mic.